Uh, good evening. Happy Sabbath to everyone. It's, uh, it's great being here with you guys and uh, always a privilege and a responsibility to share God's word uh, with you guys. And um, as we're talking about prophecy tonight, I'm not going to focus so much on facts about the beasts and powers. Um, tonight it's more like a, a question for you guys of what is our response to the things that we're seeing around, right? Um, could it be that as God's people, I believe we all want to be God's people, amen, right? We want to be sons and daughters. We want to be students of the word. We want to be followers of Christ. But the question for me and for you this evening is, as we see the signs around us, have we been convinced that God's word is true, only convinced, or have we been converted by God's word? And so that's the question. Could it be that we are convinced? Obviously, we can't deny or have we taken that extra step further and allow God to um, convert our hearts with His Word? And so that's the question. Uh, the title today is, How Long, O Lord? So I need His help. You need His help this evening. So let's uh, bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for this time that You've given us and guiding us as I heard the testimonies, the prayer request. We know that we have so much need, but most of all, we want to thank You, Lord, for Your great love and mercy at every moment. We know that you're guiding us. It's not coincidence that you have us here uh, tonight. We know that the spiritual walk with you requires even a greater discipline than even the things around us in this life. And so we, we thank you, Father, for guiding us here. And Lord, I ask you to bless this time. Cleanse my mind, my heart. Forgive me of anything that has offended you or separates me uh, from you or my brothers this evening, that uh, your word may be shared clearly and only your word uh, may be exalted. Use me, give us your Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds as we open your word as well. For all these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Once again, like just, I know it's hard, it's tough. As a teacher, it's so every day it's different with my students, Monday through Friday, trying to get their attention. And I hope it's not me, but the Holy Spirit keeps you awake today. Um, actually, this picture was funny because I used to have it a little more expanded. There's a couple... Uh, in the background, and they're also sleeping. I'm like, oh, how romantic. They're sleeping at church together, right? <laughs> so um, always I love, love to use this quote because there's a time, guys, we're living in our generation, especially whether you consider yourself, I don't know, labels a lot of people say, Generation X and Generation Y and Zs or Millennials or whatever you want to see. The point is that we're living in a culture that's becoming more and more hypersensitive. Right? There's always two topics that people like to avoid at the ta table. They've always said that. Please don't talk about these things when you go to a family reunion. What are the two topics? Politics and religion, right? And we're becoming more and more hypersensitive. So, and I understand that we also, just like Paul says, we, as he, to the Romans, he became a Roman. To the Jews, he became a Jew. So my goal is always to speak the truth in love. And there are a lot of people speaking the truth with no love. And there are a lot of people talking about love without much truth. We need to have both. Because even 1 Corinthians, which is the love chapter, says that love rejoices in the truth. Amen. So you cannot have expressed true love to someone. I always use this uh, example. How would you like to be in a relationship where that person always hid things from you and never told you the truth? Would that be an expression of love? And then when you ask them, why didn't you tell me? Their response was always, is because I didn't want to offend you. I didn't want to hurt you. I, didn't, I thought you would get mad, and that's why I didn't tell you the truth. A relationship like that would not last too long. Interesting, guys, one of the things as we see the signs around us is that young people, everyone the, tonight, God's people in this hour, whether you're a student of the Bible or not, I hope you are this evening and you become one, is that God is going to, is calling each and every one of us to have one of the gifts of the Spirit that many times is neglected. And that gift or fruit of the Spirit is called patience. I don't know if you guys have ever been at a long line, whether it's at a ride for a, an amusement or being at the Department of Motor Vehicles, which I cannot stand, right? Even, even when you make an appointment, it's still long. And it's interesting because I was there a few years ago. It's been a while, but I always like to just sit around. It's not like I try to make people feel weird, but I like to just look around to see what people do while they wait. Haven't you ever taken the time just to see what do people do while they're waiting for an event to happen? Um, I was at, like I said, I remember a few years ago being at the 
at the DMV and I saw some people on their phones, other people reading a magazine, other people impatient getting mad at the person at the register already complaining that they've been there for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, two hours, some people yelling, I'm out of here. Everyone is waiting for the event, but they're all reacting to that wait in a different way. How are we reacting? What are we doing while we wait for the greatest event in Earth's history, which is the second coming of Jesus Christ? Have you thought about that? What are you doing while you wait? Aren't we all waiting? We're waiting for something to happen. What are we doing while we wait? Well, the Bible tells us for we will not see this second coming if we don't have patience. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We always talk about the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, and we forget that first part of the verse, which is patience. If we don't have patience, we will not endure till the end. The Bible tells us that not only so, but we glory in tribulations and also knowing that tribulations work with patience. It's not a coincidence that God is asking us to have patience, especially in our generation. We're so impatient. Do you realize now we want everything fast? Everything is like fast food, right? Even when, the, when we're in a drive through and they take 15 minutes, we're already getting mad. Really? They made your food in 15 minutes. That's fast, and we're still already mad that we're impatient. Why'd you take so long? You've got to give me a free free meal, right, with that, right, because you took too long, right? Remember, I remember back in the day, there was a pizza loca, 30 minutes or less, or it's free, right? And, right, and people would be, like, standing there waiting for the pizza driver. Oh, you took 32 minutes. I want that free pizza, right? People, we don't realize that in the spiritual life, God does not do anything by coincidence. He wants us to exercise faith because that is the only way that we will endure what's coming, it says, Paul says it, and patience, experience, and experience leads to the ultimate thing, which is hope. Hope in Jesus, hope in eternal life, hope in his second coming. You know, we want fast food. You know, nowadays, only in California, now we do, uh, I remember we used to do uh, days where we would fast the entire day. Now people don't want to fast the entire day and pray. They want to do half fast or quick fast, all right? Fast, fast, slim fast, everything fast, right? They don't want to do that. Like now, when we used to do evangelistic series, I remember as a kid, my dad could tell me, the pastor would come, it would be three, four weeks of evangelistic series. People can't stand that anymore. Now they want everything condensed in a, just a three-day weekend. So the poor pastor has to condense like something that used to take a month now to try to, they want fast food. Guys, we're becoming more and more impatient. And this is the current state of affairs, not only in might be our condition spiritually within the church, but look at the state of the world I don't have to repeat this. I'm not going to talk too much about this. But the Bible is clear. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes in various places, famines, pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs in heaven. Do you realize that we're living at a time where all four signs were living simultaneously now? Before we used to talk about maybe one or the other. Aren't we seeing natural disasters? But people say, oh, but natural disasters all the time. Yes, it's true. There have been natural disasters since the inception of sin. But do you realize that now, not only are they becoming more frequent, but now they're affecting everyone on a global scale. Before, it used to be, oh, poor people all the way in Africa and Asia that I heard of an earthquake. But do you realize that now that natural disaster has a direct effect on us now? Didn't a pandemic just start? It started in China, had a direct effect on us. Right? We can't, we're not isolated anymore. We're living at a time called globalization now, where everything affects us indirectly and directly. Are we seeing more famines? Anybody heard about the, the baby formula shortage going on right now? I don't know if you've been affected. I know I, I'm glad I gave up baby formula a long time ago, but, uh, uh, or, those or those little things, but it's affecting us. We see more. I don't even know what to think anymore. Now monkeypox became popular now in the media. Supposedly the, the HWO and the federal government has actually bought thousands and thousands of vaccines. Do they know what's coming? I'm not here to enter into conspiracy theories or speculations. I want to see what the word, we know wars and rumors of wars always, but they're all happening simultaneously now. But is this the end? It is not. The Bible tells us that this is only the beginning of birth pains. There is a sign that will let us know that we're close, and I'll explain. The servant of the Lord says the following, as if she was standing in our days, the commentary on this specific verse. The conditions of things in this world show that troubleous times are right upon us. The daily papers, 
I guess for us in our time would be TikTok and Twitter and Instagram, right? Are indications of a terrible conflict in the near future. Bold robberies are of a frequent occurrence. Do you realize people aren't scared anymore to steal? They're stealing in broad daylight. And the laws, the civil laws that they're making are actually promoting this because they now know that I can go into a store and if I steal only X amount, nothing could happen to me. I'll be treated as a misdemeanor and a pat on the back. So I go, I can go literally into a store, CVS, Walmart. I know that if I steal less than a certain X amount, depending on the city or county you live here in California, it will be treated as a misdemeanor. It's almost like a slap on the wrist. Bold robberies are of a frequent occurrence. Strikes are becoming more common. Thefts and murders are committed on every hand. And men possessed of demons are taking the lives of women, men, and little children. Just in the last few days, how many mass shootings have we had? All the way from Buffalo to Texas. I mean, here in California, right? The church, right? We're not even safe in church anymore. Men have become infatuated with vice and every species of evil prevails. The enemy has succeeded in perverting justice and filling men's hearts with the desire for selfish gain. Justice standeth afar for truth is falling in the street and equity cannot enter. People claim they want social justice but they cannot have because man wants to solve their own problems without including their creator and their savior. Men work in vain. In the great cities, you don't even have, when was the last time you went to San Diego, Los Angeles? I went there just a few weeks ago. In the great cities, there are multitudes living in poverty and wretchedness, well nigh destitute of food, shelter, and clothing, while in the same cities are those who have more than their heart could wish, who live luxuriously, spending their money on richly furnished houses, on personal adornment, or worse, upon the gratification on sensual appetites, on liquor, tobacco, and other things that destroy the powers of the brain, unbalance the mind, and debase the soul. The cries of starving humanity are coming up before God, while by every species of oppression and extortion, men are piling up colossal fortunes. Guys, we're seeing the rise of monopolies where every, the means of production, everything, the resources are being controlled by a very few, and this will bring about a time of great trouble soon. And we're seeing it. What are we waiting for? For an economic collapse, another pandemic? What are we waiting for as God's people? We see epidemics. I was just, uh, I just driving through LA, getting off the freeway there, the 101 where the 10 meet. Before, I remember there's always been Skid Row. Even in Los Angeles, I grew up in LA. But now, it's not just contained to a few blocks. It is now kilometers and kilometers of just tents. Tents. What's happening in the world's richest nation on earth, the world's most powerful nation, this is what's happening? Are we getting there to the limit? The prophecies of James chapter 5 are fulfilling where God is going to give an, ask everyone to give an account of what we've done with our, uh, the goods that we've had. There are not many even among educators and statements who comprehend the causes that underline the present state of society. People, good, sincere people, young people, our age, protesting, wanting social justice, equity, fighting for rights. But if they only realize that there's something deeper, there's the root cause, and they don't understand what the root cause is. It says, those who hold the reins of government are not able to solve the problems of moral corruption, poverty, pauperism, homelessness, and increasing crime. They are struggling in vain to place business operations on a more secure basis. If men and women would give more heed to the teachings of God's word, they would find a solution of the problems that perplex them. And I, and I just want to encourage you, are you going through problems right now? Financial problems, health problems? You know, if we only took the time to look and search the scriptures, we would find the solutions to great our life's greatest problems. If we only took the time, and if society took the time, if governments took the time, in vain do they work because man has always sought to be the architect of his own destiny in life, but without including God in it. We could see that all the way since the Tower of Babel, right? Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man as his work shall be. And this is what the Bible is telling us. But, guys, we're not going to have, as we get closer to the time of the end, the Bible does warn us that we, even within the church, not talking about those outside, even within the church that at one time professed to believe in the nearness of God's coming, believing as God's word, I guess the weight kind of wore them out. And this is what happens. This, we can all be guilty of this. If eventually you get so sick and tired of waiting sometimes, it's like your reaction could be totally where you now hate the very thing that you were waiting for. 
Huh. Mockers, the last day mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts now, and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning. Do you hear that now? You know, the devil has always led us, especially our generation, to extremes. He either tells us this, the enemy of the souls tells us this, either we go to extremes where we live in a constant state of fear of what we see, and we get into conspiracy theories and, and speculations uh, way, and we depart from the Bible, and then it leads to a spirit of fanaticism where people eventually uh, mock us and make fun of what we believed. Or we go to the other extreme where we say, you know what, everything is going to be all right. All of this has happened. God's not coming for another thousand years. I've got to live my life. Why? Eat, drink, for tomorrow we die, right? So the Bible has always, the, the enemy of the souls has always led us to those extremes. But the Bible, just like the psalmist says, neither take my foot to the left or to the right, but guide me in your paths right in the middle. Right? And that's what God wants to do. So we don't have to live in these extreme times as Bible students, as students of the Word of God. We don't have to go living in a constant state of fear because we know that the Bible tells us that God is our ever-present help in trouble. It says, though the, though the seas rage and the rays and the earth be shaken, we will not fear. And at the same time, we know that we can stand on God's Word, that any false doctrine, anything that leads us away from God's Word, the Holy Spirit will give us a spirit of discernment so we can understand. But why, and this is the question that I've had. You know, I remember five, six years old, being in, growing up in the church, hearing Jesus is coming. Prepare in Spanish, right? Preparate que ya viene esto. I remember when 1999 came, Y2K is coming. That's going to lead up to the uh, events, and it's going to lead to martial law and the one world government. Then I remember in 1991, same thing. Russia fell, the Soviet Union, it's all coming, and yet years later, we're still here, right? We're still driving our cars, we got our jobs, some of us are finishing up school, some of us got married, some of us are waiting to have another kid. It's almost like life is just, the cycle is just going on, just like first period. But look at what it says. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness. You know what a slacker is? It's someone that just kind of doesn't care, that waits, kind of lazy, it's, uh, but God is not that, but is long-suffering us toward not willing that any should what? Perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then the question is, if the things were to happen, we want him to come. But let's say he was to come this very night. How would we respond? Remember, there's only going to be two responses when Christ comes. There's going to be a group that's going to say, this is, this is our Redeemer. This is whom we have waited for him, Right? We're going to wake, uh, look up to the sky, the light. He will not run from the light because we've been walking in the light. And there's going to be another response that says, rocks and mountains, please fall on us. There's only two responses to Christ's second coming. What response would you have tonight if he were to come? What response would I have? Why the apparent delay? Well, in mercy to the world, Jesus delays his coming that sinners may have an opportunity to hear the warning and find in him a shelter before the wrath of God shall be poured out. That's why we've already passed the year 2000 and he's not here because his mercy and his love still extends to you and me and for those that have not had the opportunity to hear. How many of our neighbors, how many of our friends, we still have not told that there's a God that not only created them, loves them, but is soon to come. You know, in our history here as a church, we also experienced this apparent delay. We saw, we saw it in the end uh, when Moses, Joshua, they entered the promised land. It was God's intention that Israel, as soon as they left Egypt, that bondage representing the bondage of sin, they were to enter the promised land right away. But what happened? There was a delay, right? And was it God's fault that there was a delay? No. It was the response that these people gave, Israel gave, and we're going to see the same thing in our in experience as a church, and I'll talk about that right now. It says, it was not God's will that Israel should wander for 40 years in the wilderness. He wanted to lead them directly to the land of Canaan and establish them a holy and happy people to be a light to the world, to the Gentiles. But they could not enter because of what? Unbelief. And unbelief has different symptoms. You might say, but I believe. Right? I can believe, but like I said, the question is, are we convinced or are we converted? 
Because of their backsliding and apostasy, they perished in the desert, and others were raised up to enter the promised land. Now, I pray that this is not our experience to our generation. Are we going to be here another 40 years where I will have to then pass the torch to another generation that's coming up because our generation somehow was not faithful to our calling? That's a big question. I hope. I mean, my dad, I always ask my dad, do you think it's going to be another 40 years? And he's like, I don't know. Maybe God's going to call me to sleep, but I want you to be faithful. But what about if I get to be that age where God calls me to rest, maybe, and then I have to pass on the torch to another generation, maybe because I didn't do the duty, I didn't live out the calling that God had given me. Because of their backsliding apostasy, they perished and others were raised up to enter the land. In like manner, it was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be so long delayed and His people should remain so many years in this world of sin and sorrow. But unbelief separated from the God and they refused to do the work which He had appointed them and others were raised up to proclaim the message. You know, uh, young people, God has given us three things. Time, that other people wish they had. Talents, more talents that you could think of. Our generation has access to information and resources that the, our pioneers would have only dreamed of, right? And we have treasures, resources, living in this country. You know what? Realize the privilege. I've had the opportunity to be a missionary in other countries. They only dreamed that they would even have a place like we have right now. And yet it almost seems like they do more with less, and we do less with more. Interesting. My master delays is coming. How would you like um, you be a boss, you have a business, and you come back and you leave someone in charge, and you say, you know what, I'm going to give you the keys to the safe, the car, the company car, and I'm going to be gone for just a month, and I just want you to make sure you take everything, all the profit, the business, everything is going smooth. Make sure to treat your you know, fellow employees right. And all of a sudden, you come back as the boss, the owner of the business, and you find the manager in this position right here. How would you feel? How would you say, you know what? How does God feel when, if he, when he returns or sometimes he checks up on us and he finds us sleeping and not doing what we're supposed to do? It says, blessed is the servant whom the master will find doing so when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all the things he has. But if that servant says in his heart, my master's delaying. See, see what happens? See, it, this is the, the experience. This is in the flesh. That wait. What do I do while I'm waiting? It says, well, my master's delaying is coming and begins to beat the male and female servants. Do we sometimes beat each other even in the church? And to eat and drink and be drunk. And the master and that servant will come on that day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware. And he will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. In other words, if we are unfaithful to our calling, we will be counted as if we were unbelievers. So profession, mere profession will not save us. Work while we wait, and this is what I was saying. So there's a job, there's a calling, there's a mission that God has called us to do. Freely we have received the privilege of knowing Him. He has called us now with the Bible. God asks us to freely, we have received, now freely give. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten. So you want Jesus to come, how many want Him to come sooner? Right? Do you want him to come another 200 years? You want, him to, you want this world to go on for another 200 years? Well, we have the privilege that if we want him to come sooner, we can actually make him come sooner. Huh? It seems almost like, what, we can tell God? No, it's just that it's amazing that God's sovereign will always works in context of human free will. Don't you say amen? That he, he's sovereign, but he works within the context of, of the human experience and the human free will. Were all who profess His name bearing fruit to His glory, how quickly the world would be sown with the seed of the gospel, quickly the last harvest would be ripened, and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. It was not God's will that, just like in the te Old Testament church, that they just wander around, wandering, complaining and murmuring. He didn't want this to be our experience here today. Of course, the question is, who wants to go to heaven alone? You know, it's a very selfish way to think, like, with or without you, I'm going to go to heaven. You know, even Moses was willing to give up his salvation to save the people. Christ, was he willing to separate from his father eternally to risk everything, with, even with his relationship with his father, to save you and me? How much are we willing to give to save even one soul? 
It's interesting. Who wants to go to heaven alone? Would you really want to go to heaven alone? Where you don't see the, your friends, your family, your coworkers, you don't see them there? But you're like, at least I got here. And that's what I care about, me, right? What a selfish way of thinking. Who would really want to go to heaven alone? I don't want to go to heaven alone. How then can they call on the one who have not believed? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You know, this is the fi one of the final signs, and if not the final sign, that the end shall come. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. Do you realize that there's only a few places left where the gospel has not reached? You know, you might say, well, yeah, there's a lot of countries where persecuted, but even the gospel has reached some of these countries. But there's only a few, a, only a handful of countries left, or nations, where the gospel hasn't at least touched that society, at least in the limited way. When that happens, we know that Christ is ready and at the door because everyone will at least have had the, the knowledge to make at least an informed decision of who will they follow. You know, you look at this map of persecution, you can see this, this is, uh, you can find this, uh, there's this website called World Watch List out of Voice of the Martyrs, and you can see uh, some of the top countries where it's actually, you can lo lose your life, not only imprisonment or fines, but actually lose your life for being a believer. North Korea, Somalia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Sudan, not to mention some of these other countries where there's under heavy restrictions for a lot of denominations and a lot of groups, even handing out Bibles, uh, you can be in prison and lose your life. This is what our brothers and sisters around the world have been experienced already for generations. In other words, they've already been ex experiencing Luke 21 and Matthew 24 for a long time, but we haven't. But the time is coming, as you can see, and I'll show you just a little bit. God, um, young people this tonight, brothers and sisters, God will use ordinary means to do extraordinary things if we just surrender. You know, the Bible, one time when they try to shut the people up from Jesus, from saying, Hosanna, what did Jesus say? I can't tell them to be quiet. If I tell them to be quiet, even the rocks are going to cry out. You know, if we don't want to do the work that God has given us, if we don't use those times, talents, and treasures, what's going to happen is that God will then use the humblest of means to wake us up. And then we're going to see others with less privileges than us, with simple means, maybe not the same level of education, even children proclaiming the gospel, and we're going to say, well, that could have been me, and I didn't do the work that God has called me to do. The work with the church has failed to do in a time of peace and prosperity, she will have to do in a terrible crisis under most discouraging, forbidding circumstances. John chapter 9, verse 4, I'm going to show you in the next slide. What are we waiting for? You know, I would have never thought that I would have seen this sign at churches everywhere just two years ago, right? Right? What we thought was impossible became possible. And the Bible confirms this, and it says, John chapter 9, verse 4, Jesus himself, and we experience, as Christ followers, we will experience the same experience of Christ. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can what? No one will be able to work. And brothers and sisters, I believe that soon and very soon we're going to understand clearly what that phrase means, the night is coming when no one can work. The things around us that are happening socially, politically, and religiously are just coming where now it's going to be even harder to work. You know that there's a lot of cities here in the United States where it's forbidden now to even hand out tracts and leave them at people's homes now? Have you noticed that even our friends, the Jehovah Witnesses, have had to change their tactics now? because they can be fined in certain cities in the United States, and now they're standing on street corners with Bible racks. They're no longer doing the door-to-door -door because of more and more restrictions. What about us? The time is coming. That night is coming soon. The work which the church, again, has failed to do in a time of peace and prosperity, she will have to do in a terrible crisis under the most discouraging, forbidding circumstances. And you could see it happening all around. Just one example. Here, just in Finland, our neighbors in Europe... Uh, even someone from government, just a few months ago, it was a big case out there. A former Finnish interior minister has gone on trial for hate speech on, against gay people following comments in which she said were based on the Bible. The time, do you think the time is coming even here in the United States where the Bible will be considered hate speech? 
a hypersensitive culture. I mean, even if politicians are being banned and defunded, don't you think the time is coming where even the church will be censored, defunded, deplatformed, whatever you want to call it? Because some people call it hate speech, where you call someone to repentance. Well, why are you telling me to repent? My life is fine. You offend me. It hurts me that you're hurting my feelings, that you're telling me that something is wrong with my life. Is the time is coming? Only you guys need to study this on your own. And at the same time, while all these things are happening to restrict the gospel, the enemy of the souls, at the same time, there's something else that the enemy is now absorbing our minds in more and more entertainment. It's, it's funny how you look back, you know, all those. I don't want to sound like, like those cranky people that are like, oh, you and your telephones and smartphones. No, like, I mean, I experienced life before the smartphone and then half of my life with the smartphone. But it's interesting that look at the experience of those that lived before the flood. As the time of their probation was closing, the antediluvians, those were the people that lived before the flood, gave themselves up to exciting amusements and festivities. Well, we've seen that all along, but look at what it says. Those who possessed influence and power, in other words, political leaders, religious leaders living at that time, it says, were bent on keeping the minds of the people engrossed with mirth and pleasure, lest any should be impressed by the last solemn warning. Do we not see the same repeated in our day while God's servants are giving the message that the end of all things is at hand? The world is absorbed in amusements and pleasure seeking. There is a constant rouse of excitement that causes indifference to God and prevents the people from being impressed by the truths which alone can save them from the coming destruction. People rather live in the metaverse than in the real world. That's how bad we're getting, guys, that people are so dissatisfied with life and just looking for anything that's new that they would rather live in something that is not real than realize the biblical truths and that God has for this world at this time. You tell them something, they'll believe anything. You know, I had a friend in college that he was like, you pray, George? Like, I had a lab with him. He's like, you pray for your food and all that? And I was like, you think there's something up there? Really, that's listening to me? I was like, yeah, I do, because he provides for me, and that's why I pray. And it's like, oh, that's weird. Next thing you know, I'm like, where are you going? He's like, oh, I'm, I'm going to my mantra class, because tonight we're going to try to communicate with some yogis from the past. And I'm like, really? So you're making fun of me for believing something, but you believe in some spirit guides that have lived hundreds of... It's so interesting. I always get fascinated how people make fun of, for of us believing in the God of the Bible, but they'll go with anything else that's out there, right? They don't want to believe that God created the word of the universe, but scientists now are believing that because there's so much design out there that they can't deny it. Now they're saying, well, maybe extraterrestrial life planted the seeds of life here, and that's how we came about. So they rather believe in UFOs, but they don't want to believe in the God of the Bible. It's just amazing to me, just the condition. And the Bible confirms this. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. And God wants to for us to first take off our blindfolds so that we can lead to them to Christ that can take off their blindfold. How can I reach those that close it? Are you guys tired already? Just give me a few more minutes. Okay, good. How can I reach those closest to me? Now the question now hits home because I know that I still have family that do not know the Lord. I have friends and I confess I've, been, I've neglected it for so long. How can I reach those closest to me, my coworkers? Well, first of all, guys, it might seem so cliche, but pray for them and for opportunities to witness. Trust me, when you're praying, there's certain prayers where God is going to take a while to answer because he wants to teach you patience or he'll say no straight out or he'll say wait. But when you pray for an opportunity to witness, God will answer it right away because it's in accordance to his will. So you don't have to worry about that. You might be praying for a Lexus, and God is saying, no, I don't want you to have a Lexus right now. But you pray that your neighbor or your family, that uncle that you've been trying to reach, that's always at the family reunions and always is, is you're like, oh, man, I wish I could talk to that uncle, but it's so hard to tell him about God. It's so easy to talk about sports and politics and everything. But when it comes to religion, I feel so, God, give me, he will provide. Be careful what you wish for, because he will send you a lot of opportunities to, wit to witness. Hold fast to your convictions, but don't be judgmental. How can we balance this? This is the Holy Spirit. How can you hold fast to your spiritual values and your faith in Christ, while at the same time don't be judgmental, like you're just looking down on others that don't believe the same way, that don't think the same way, right? 
Be consistent in your life. Oh, this is the hardest one. How can I witness? How can I tell someone about Christ or the Sabbath or health reform when I myself am not doing it? Be consistent. Doesn't mean that you're always going to, we're going to stumble. The Bible tells us, it says even the righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up. But the Bible does tell us that he, he, God desires that we have a consistent walk with him. Okay? It's not the occasional fall that determines our character, but it's the pattern of our life. What is our pattern? Learn their needs and wants. How do we actually take time to talk to our neighbors and our friends and to learn their actual needs and wants, right? Okay? That's another thing. Take opportunities to lead conversations to deeper things of life and point them to eternal things. This is the hard one for me because it's so easy to talk to my cousins, my coworkers. I could talk about what's happening in politics. Oh, they'll love. They could talk for hours. I could talk about a sports team or the latest things or the NBA playoffs. But when I change the conversation to something spiritual, you start feeling the tension already. It's like, oh, you know what, George, I appreciate you, but you know what, what's good for you, your truth is not my truth. And they try to be respectful, they try to be courteous, and immediately you feel like they're kind of shutting you down. But pray that you can take conversations to the deeper things of life and point them to eternal things. So when you invite them to the house, it's okay to show off maybe that you got a new pool back there or something, that's fine. But take them to the, take them to the Lord that can provide all things. Take them to the provider and the healer. When they're sick, don't just point them to the healer of their body, but point them to the healer of their soul, right? So t- pray for those opportunities. You know, when we're not consistent, we leave a stain. And even the Apostle Paul tells us that we can cause even others to blaspheme God's name when we're not consistent in our spiritual walk. And we have to be very careful, uh, young people, tonight. Because there's so much temptation out there, so much out there that's bombarding us so we can stumble in our, in our walk with Christ. You know, the great civil rights leader, Mahatma Gandhi, that fought for um, the civil rights uh, in India uh, during the time of their, the War of Independence there in India from England, from the Great Britain, he actually had an opportunity to visit Christian churches. He was acquainted with the teachings of Christ. He had read the Bible, especially the New Testament, specifically the Gospels. But unfortunately, only God knows what was in his heart till the day he died. We don't know. But this is what he said in his, what we would call his autobiography. He had a, he had a book entitled, What Jesus Means to Me. Because people always ask him, what do you think about Christ? Because you said, well, you're like Christ. You're like pacifist. He believed in nonviolence. He believed in equality, social justice. But he said, the message of Jesus, as I understood it, it contained in the Sermon on the Mount, unadulterated and taken as a whole. If then I had to face only the Sermon on the Mount and my own interpretation of it, I should not hesitate to say, oh yes, I am a Christian. But negatively, I can tell you that in my humble opinion, what passes as Christianity is a negation of the Sermon on the Mount. Why did he say this? He had the opportunity to visit a Christian church there in India. And even in the Christian church that they claimed to be following the teachings of Christ in the Sermon of the Mount, he realized and he saw even within the church in India what the churches taking on the racism, the caste system. He saw that even within those that claim to be Christians would separate people within the church based on the skin color. And he said, is this what Christ is teaching? And after that, do you think that he ever walked into a Christian church after seeing that? He did not, as far as we know. Only God knows his heart, what he took. We know that God will judge us based on the light we had, right? And so I pray that somehow he was touched by Christ's teaching. Unfortunately, um, Christianity, or what we represented, unfortunately, was something negative in his light. You know, it's the world will be convinced not by what the pulpit teaches. It's great what I'm sharing with you tonight. Sermons are great. Bible studies are great, but you know the greatest testimony, it says, by what the church lives. The minister in the desk, that's you, that's me, the minister in the desk announces the theory of the gospel, but the practical piety of the church demonstrates its power. In other words, only putting into action demonstrates that it's actually effective. Because I could, I could, you guys might say, man, that guy preaches well, but if I'm not living it, eventually what ends up happening, there's no power behind it. 
And this is what's happening. And because of iniquity, we also see the signs around us. People's love is becoming cold. Even people are scared to even give money to someone. You know, the other day I saw a lady just pulled out in the street. I was even scared to help her out to jumpstart her battery because I was like, maybe they'll attack me. It's the middle of the night. And there's so much wickedness now that people are even scared to do kind, uh, acts of uh, kindness because of danger now. I, I wouldn't recommend any young lady stopping by to help anybody. It's not that you're like saying, oh, that's not the Christian thing to do. Unfortunately, we also have to be wise as serpents, right? Humble as doves, but wise as serpents. That's not safe anymore. Like it's not like it was before. You just see people, someone waving in the street like needs help. How do you know now? You know, I had a cousin that was, had helped to someone out, helped out a young lady, and the young lady had two other gentlemen in the car waiting just to steal from him. You don't know anymore. It says, because of the iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. But I have one thing against you, talking to the church, that you have left your first love. And this is why the Bible is asking us to return to our first love. That what you felt for Christ when you first met him. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen from, repent and do the first works. Have you ever fallen cold in a relationship, a friendship? a marriage, something that's something terrible where you're just going through the motions, but there's no more excitement, no more passion for mission. You're not walking together as you used to. The Bible is now calling us that with Christ, we can return to our first love in this time. We need patience in our daily walk, as I mentioned, and I said why we need that patience. And you know, Psalms gives us a great promise for those of you that are struggling being patient with God. Maybe you've been praying for something for years and it seems like God is not answering a struggle of things, something that you're struggling with in your own spiritual walk, something that no one else knows but only God, something in your family, something around you that scares you at this moment, but says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not yourself for the, over the one who prospers in His way over the man who carries out evil devices. You know, I talk to a lot of young people when I go to the churches and even not different places, even high schools, uh, not even in a religious environment. And they tell me, you know what, what good is it to do what's right? I see all the people having fun. They're enjoying their life. Why do you want me to like not have fun? You want me to not enjoy my teens and my 20s? They're out there partying, doing this and this and this and this. They're having fun. And then when I try to be good, I feel alone. I feel like life is just like, I try and I just, God doesn't answer my prayers, but I see them prospering. They have cars, they have money, they have this, they have that. The Bible tells us to be, wait patiently for Him. And in due time, He will reveal the difference between following the enemy and following Christ. Is it worth it to follow Christ? It might not seem like it at first. You know, the world will trick you saying, you know, you're going to miss out on all these things. But you know what? The devil only gives you half-truths. He doesn't tell you that, yeah, you'll have a lot of fun. It's fun to do those things in the flesh. But he doesn't tell you what happens after where you will have to carry scars and that empty feeling where that time lost, you cannot recover. The only thing that you could do after that is redeem the time, but you can't recover it. From time to time, the Lord has made known his manner of his working. He is mindful of what is passing upon the earth. And when a crisis has come, he has revealed himself and has interposed to hinder the workings of Satan's plan. Sometimes it seems that the Lord just waits for you to have a moment of crisis. Why? Because he wants to reveal himself. You would not have understood. You would have thought that within your own power you could do it. So in his mercy, he allows, not that he causes those crises, but he allows it and he permits it. So what? He has often permitted matters with nations, with families, and with individuals to come to a crisis that his interference might become marked. Then he has let the fact be known that there was a God in Israel who would sustain and vindicate his people. Many times when God pulled him out of a crisis, the human pride and heart, we kind of forget that he saved us. And we say we did it in our own power. So God will many times allow those trials and tribulations to come so that we don't forget some soul-searching questions that we have as we enter this time of what we could see, these interesting times that we're living, urgent times. Are we growing daily in Christ through prayer and Bible study? So you don't have to say yes or no as I close tonight. Are we bearing the fruits of the Spirit in our daily lives? Number three, have we shared Christ with our family, friends, and colleagues? 
you know, if we're answering yes, then that, do, then that means that we do believe that Christ is coming soon. Right? Because our response, our reaction, right? Have we surrendered that which separates us from God and from one another? Maybe there's still that sin that easily besets us. I don't know what you're going through. You don't know what I'm going through. But God, Christ knows. Are we reflecting Christ in our home to our spouse and our children? It's easy sometimes to be, como dicen en español, caldín la fuera, oscuridad de la casa, right? It's easy sometimes to smile, help out, but when we come home with those that we're supposed to actually reach out first, our first mission, our Jerusalem, many times we don't reflect Christ in our home. We sometimes laugh and we're, we help and do kinds of service to other people, so we put on a show, but we come home, we yell at our parents, we yell at our spouse, we have fights, are, have we, are we reflecting Christ first in our home, in our spouse and children? That we, can't, we can't reflect Christ in the church here. Healthy, ch- healthy homes, healthy families, healthy church. Why do you think our churches are not healthy sometimes? That's something to think about. Healthy, if you really want to have a healthy church, have a healthy home first, right? And for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has new pleasure. God is saying that if you give up, if you fall and you just start becoming impatient and you start doing what the the parable of the um, unwise or the unfaithful servant, well, my master delays, maybe Jesus will come here maybe in a hundred years. So let me live another ten years for myself, right? Let me just have a little more fun, do the things. My soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition. So in other words, it's saying we're not those that are going to go back to what we lived before Christ, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. And I close with this tonight. This is now I love to always close. It might have been a a difficult message, maybe a message of urgency, but I always like to close with a message of hope in Christ. Jesus is just as near to us amidst the seeds of tempest and trial as he was to his followers who were tossed in the Sea of Galilee. Remember when his disciples, Jesus, don't you know that we're perishing? Don't you care? Sometimes we complain to God. Don't you care that I'm going through this? It seems like you're not answering my prayers. We must have calm, steady, firm, unwavering trust in God. We must now have an individual experience, not the pastor's faith, not your parents' faith, not my faith, an individual experience in holding fast unto God. Christ is on board the vessel. Believe that Christ is our captain, that he will take care not only of us, but of the ship. And so I encourage you tonight that whatever is to happen next week, the month, whatever Ukraine decides to do, or Russia, what the church leaders, or what, what our leaders here in the United States, whatever, if Christ is the captain of our ship, we will always get to shore safely. Amen. So, And may the Lord bless his hearing. Thank you for your attention tonight. And it's been a blessing being here with you guys. So.